I should spend about next 10, 15 minutes covering this magnetic materials. This is really the reason we did dielectrics. And um, so it, it, uh, I think we'll be leaving important piece of this course out if we, I don't ever talk about magnetic materials. So, so uh, let me do that. So, um, oh, I, so, um, so I want to play the uh, the <laughs> unlisted lecture video. The first two minutes of it um, as a kind of a demonstration of why the magnetic materials is important. So let me do that first about the first two minutes, and I want to use the the section of the textbook to talk about what kind of considerations go into in uh, working with magnetism in matter. So. So let me uh, first play that. So, so you know, you've seen this work as an electromagnet, right? But when you actually look at it, it's not a, a very strong electromagnet. Um, so I have this uh, steel ball here, which I can attempt to, to pick up using this electromagnet. And I will, you know, put through maximum current like I did before, after this cools down a little bit. Um, the thing is with the wires heating up, it's, a, a, it's a, a vicious cycle. The more it heats up, the resistance increases. So, um, anyways, so now uh, let me turn on the magnetic field to the maximum possible. And when I try to pick this up, I can't really pick it up. But you have seen me actually pick up the steel ball before, right? How did I do that then? Like if this magnet is right now strong enough. Now, uh, you might not remember how I did it. Do you know, uh, have you seen electromagnets that like practical electromagnets people use? Is it really literally just a coil of wire or are there other parts to a uh, practical electromagnet? Other parts. Other parts. Okay, what are the other parts? Another, uh, like a, another flat piece of ferromagnet uh, Well, if it has a ferromagnet, then it's not an electromagnet. There's another piece of iron. Um, it's uh, the iron core. So this is a, uh, uh, this is a, uh, um, uh, I think it's a ferromagnetic. I don't know exactly what it is, but it does stick to magnet. So I think it's at least the ferromagnetic. So um, I have a ferromagnetic material and when I put it in here, and so right now it doesn't work because you know this is not an actual magnet. Um, it's just a piece of iron or something close to it. Um, but once I turn on the current, now the magnetic field will be strong enough to actually pick this up. So let's try that. So turn it on. Yeah, now it's strong enough to pick it up uh, fairly easily. In fact, I can go down in current quite a bit before it drops the ball. Okay. Yeah, I, I only need something like one ampere of current a third of the current that I was using to pick up this ball. So what happened? Why is the magnetic field now stronger? I think that's uh, about where, so, you know, that demonstration, that's a little bit <laughs> too much work to set up for this Zoom session. I wanted to play that to show um, in practical uses where you really have to consider magnetism in matter, not just uh, um, the magnetism in vacuum. So what you see in the video clip is that for something simple like electromagnet, you have to use a ferromagnetic core. And later on, when we do the AC circuits or time dependent circuits, when you see inductor, you will see that the um, inductor also uses a, uh, the ferromagnetic core material. If you just try to form on, um, if you try to use something like a solenoid with nothing in it, then, um, it it doesn't really work well. So, because in practical uses of magnetism, the, the we that's where the properties of magnetic materials come in. I want you to make sure that we cover that, so that we don't we are not leaving significant gaps in something that you ought to know if uh, um, you are dealing with the magnetism later. So this is the last section in chapter 12. I realized 
people might still be working through chapter 12. Um, but I think this section to some degree kind of stands on its own. So um, we can um, we can talk through it um, as it stands on its own. So magnetism in matter gets uh, um, potentially complicated. Uh, let me contrast it with uh, electricity in matter. So we talked about electricity in matter when we um, when we talked about capacitor with a dielectric or molecular model of a dielectric. So this is basically electricity in matter. And um, the reason we covered this was so that we have something to compare to when we do when we do the magnetic materials. I realized this the first time I taught physics of 4B that, oh, I guess I don't need this section, I need the next section. Uh, first time I taught physics 4B, I actually skipped this material thinking, hey, not that important. You'll cover this in upper division. But when we got to magnetism and we needed to talk about um, magnetism with magnetic materials that um, we didn't have this convenient analogy to electricity. So, uh, so we, did, we did talk about dielectric, uh, particularly when we were talking about capacitor. And there's the kind of uh, material picture of uh, how dielectrics affect um, operation of something like a capacitor plate. And this is how it works. It, um, so in this picture, the dielectric reduces the electric field uh, in between the plates. So it increases the capacitance of the capacitor because you are storing the same amount of charge with a sm smaller voltage difference between the plates. And th there was a model of how we did that. Um, they defined the electric constant. And I hope they talk about something about um, polarization, do they not? <laughs> okay, they don't. Um, but there is a, I think, let's see here. Um, I, th I think there's a, some place where they hopefully talk about how capacitance changes. Mm. Okay, they're not making the comparison the easiest. <laughs> um, so, I guess I'll fill uh, write in the um, uh, fill in the uh, missing equation that I hope I wish you were here. So this is the example uh, looking at the it, it's the well it's an example dealing with a capacitor um, in two different settings one without the dielectric one with the dielectric and when you have dielectric that changes the capacitance. And I will just uh, refer to this uh, formula to refer to these expressions to show uh, how that modification was made. Because recalling that modification, I think will be useful in understanding how when you consider magnetism in matter, that changes, um, that changes the expressions. So, um, I think what's uh, useful to consider is what the typical expression for this capacitance is. If you have a vacuum or air gap capac capacitor, this capacitance for parallel plate capacitors, I happen to have this memorized. It's a permittivity of free space times the area divided by the separation between them. And, or, or sorry, I labeled it wrong. So this would be the, uh, this expression would be the C naught. That's this expression here. And, and, um, and the capacitance of the capacitor with the dielectric, this is how they write it. They wrote it as um, the capacitance is this a dielectric constant kappa times the capacitance with the air gap. And when I write this out in terms of the expressions for the, for the parallel plate capacitor, then this is what it looks like. Kappa times epsilon naught times the area of the capacitor plate 
divided by the distance between them. And this expression here is that expression is what can be used to characterize the um, characterize the electric property of the material. So you have you have heard me refer to this as uh, with this phrase, uh, permittivity of free space. And um, if you understand the permittivity as some old fashioned term that refers to something having to do with electricity, then uh, you might wonder what does this free space mean? Like free space, what are we talking about? <laughs> and uh, free space refers to vacuum. So when I refer to this constant as permittivity of free space, what I'm talking about is the electric properties of the vacuum. So we can talk about this as, um, as the, just the permittivity, uh, permittivity of whatever material, permittivity of, I don't know, ceramic, then um, permittivity of ceramic would be this uh, entire quantity here. Um, I wish uh, I should have tried this before the session, but let me just uh, give it a try. If I search on Wolfram Alpha for, uh, let me get rid of these notations. So, you know, if I just search for permittivity of free space, Wolfram Alpha knows what I'm talking about. It gives me epsilon naught, the electric constant. Now, let me try typing it permittivity of ceramic. See if uh, Wolfram Alpha will understand what I mean. Um, it might not. There's a good chance of that happening. <laughs> um, what are some constants that are here? Uh, let's see, vacuum. I guess I could try Teflon. Permitted. Ah, oh, wait, 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 wait. Um, and it's only giving me relative permittivity. So the kappa is what's called relative permittivity. And uh, let me just try permittivity of Teflon. So, um, yeah, so, so the kappa is, so, um, okay. So that, that kappa is, so this kappa is giving me the relative permittivity. And when you multiply that with the, the, the vacuum permittivity is when you get the actual, just the electric property of the material. And uh, that kind of notation is what you will see with the magnetic matter as well. Now with the magnetic matter, things get a little bit more complicated. Uh, when we are dealing with the electric, the electricity matter, Dielectric was basically the only thing we talked about. This uh, model of how um, dielectric works, that's basically it. This, this describes basically every single insulator, well, yeah, almost every single insulator, and we are done. We don't really have to worry so much. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, there, are the, there are crystals with a particular structure that are more interesting, nonlinear, but to the extent that things uh, respond in a linear way, this is how you would describe it. With the magnetic matter, uh, the textbook already uh, tells you about three different types of magnetic material. It's right at the top here. Uh, paramagnetic material, diamagnetic material and ferromagnetic material. And um, what I have to lead with is that uh, within classical physics, we don't really have good um, explanations or derivations for magnetic properties of material. To explain each of these properties, how they come about, you need a quantum mechanics. So. Um, in this session, I'm not going to attempt to explain why ferromagnetic material is ferromagnetic. Other than that, it is. Other than that, it is. And what parameters we use to characterize these materials? So most uh, materials are uh, paramagnetic, and I think you are going to see an example of how uh, paramagnetism works when you work through 
uh, one of the homework questions that uh, I guess technically due tonight. Uh, one of the conceptual questions um, this week talks about goes into this uh, magnetic materials. So, um, so I, I think uh, as you work through this, uh, you will see how paramagnetism plays out. So, so take a look <laughs> or give it a try. And um, I need to write up actually answer to this after this session. Um, so, uh, so paramagnetic material, uh, most, um, I think paramagnetism describes more materials than either diamagnetic or ferromagnetism. Um, so um, now paramagnetism tends to be fairly weak. It, um, so you have some alignment of the magnetic dipole moments in the material along the direction of magnetic field. And the effect of that tends to be relatively weak. And um, I hope as you are looking at this, this expression, oh, I guess that's how sh I should have compared it. The, the magnetic field uh, with the, um, or the induced magnetic field due to the applied magnetic field, um, it's usually proportional and um, no, no, no. Uh, so there's, yeah, so this kappa, sorry, it's this cap, uh, this chi, or um, I, I don't think this chi really matches up with how kappa was used in the other one. Let me just double check. Because when you look at this uh, kappa, yeah, it's comparing the net electric field. So, okay, that's not the right comparison. <laughs> so, <laughs> So this portion, read through it, work through it. Now, what, where I want to draw the comparison to is here. So when they, as they finish the derivation for the magnetic field of an infinite solenoid, this expression here is with a solenoid with a vacuum, with no magnetic material inside. That, so this mu naught is the permeability of a free space. So, the so this constant here, this is uh, what the old fashioned term for it is permeability of free space. Again, accepting that the word permeability is old fashioned term that applies to some sort of magnetic property. Free space refers to vacuum. So what this constant describes is the magnetic property of the vacuum. And with this um, polarizability, what you can describe is um, just the permeability of materials. So this uh, I can just refer to as permeability of whatever material it is we are dealing with. So the effect of the magnetic material is that wherever you have this constant permeability of free space, um, you can kind of replace it with another constant oftentimes. Uh, that constant represents the, the magnetic property of the material. And if you are dealing with a paramagnetic material, then this, uh, this chi would be some number bigger than zero. So this mu would be greater than um, greater than mu naught and it'll tend to enhance the magnetic field inside the solenoid. And I, I think the most common magnetic material we find used for is a ferromagnetic material. And oh, I guess I need to skip over the diagonal. <laughs> so this chi, it tends to be relatively small value for a lot of these paramagnetic materials. You know, a lot of metals, oxygen is famously paramagnetic. Um, with the ferromagnetic material, you can talk about um, some kind of polarization and it tends to be uh, fairly strong. There's something about magnetic domain that I'm not gonna attempt to explain. And if you work out what the effective value of polarizability is, it turns out to be pretty high, you know, six times 10 to the three uh, for, um, for, well, as a typical value. Compare that with 
the constant for the, the paramagnetism. The oxygen, even liquid oxygen, which is fairly paramagnetic is 3.5 times 10 to the minus three. So it's about a um, million times more polar polarizable than some of the most paramagnetic material. And uh, with the ferromagnetic materials, you will see that your textbook doesn't give you a table of uh, polarizability. That's because uh, it's not quite linear. So in fact, it also exhibits a hysteresis, which we won't really get into. You can read about it. It's a fairly interesting effect. Um, so, um, so this is a kind of quick-ish <laughs> overview of uh, magnetic materials. Uh, one thing I would uh, point out is I kind of skipped over the diamagnetism. I think uh, um, diamagnetism, once again, all three effects, paramagnetism, diamagnetism, ferromagnetism, uh, there is no good way to explain them classically. Um, I, all of them requires uh, some bit of quantum mechanics to fully explain it. Um, I think uh, what we did in the conceptual questions for paramagnetism <laughs> is as close as we can get without explicitly invo invoking quantum mechanics and particle properties. Um, and later on, oh, you know, actually in one week, uh, we'll be in a better place to talk about diamagnetic materials when we have talked about uh, Faraday's law and electromagnetic induction and Lenz's law. So I'll reserve uh, discussion of diamagnetism until then. Um, and you know, even then it's again, not a full explanation of diamagnetism. It, you, do, you need to bring in quantum mechanics for any full explanation of magnetic properties. So, so this is the um, overview lecture on magnetic materials and it kind of stands on its own. Um, the Most of the chapter, most of what we are covering this week, um, it can be covered quite independently of magnetic materials. Um, but when you think about practical application of magnetism, um, you can't fact that uh, there are such things as ferromagnetic materials and those properties play a significant role. So I wanted to make sure we had a space in the course for that, uh, for talking about magnetism better.